Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, PBM, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Marks Paneth, Capital One Bank. Additional funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmatidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, People's United Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, and these friends. What's really happening in New York City and the suburbs? I don't really have the answer. So today I brought the guru who truly understands New York City and the area's real estate, Scott Breckler, chairman of the board and CEO of RxR Realty. So Scott, you have 25 million square feet of, of office space. You have developments in the suburbs. You have other properties. You're a lender. You're in, into data. Let's talk about the office market today, how, how you look at it. Well, first of all, thanks for having me and congratulations on 20 years. That's pretty extraordinary and it's a great. You are my 1300th show today. That's unbelievable. Quite a feat. So, you know, I mean, listen, we've had uh, a real challenging year. Um, and uh, as, as everyone knows, this is, you know, being the epicenter of COVID and a, a perspective that, the, you know, people questioning the future of New York. Will New York be able to come back? And it's not the first time that New York's future has been questioned. We've lived this together through 9-11, we lived at uh, Superstorm Sandy, the great financial crisis, and people write the obituary for New York. And, uh, and you know, historically, um, they, that, that's too premature and people don't have, New York tends to build back better and stronger than before. Um, th this was a little bit of an existential crisis and there's sort of the, the, the normal cyclical challenges that we face, but structural challenges as COVID has changed the, people, the way that people live work and operate in, in urban environments. Um, and so, you know, the, a lot of what the energy that had drove New York's success in the past was put on pause, but that's really what it was. It was a pause. And I would say when uh, President Biden announced uh, the vaccinations would be accelerated and that any adult that wanted to have a vaccine would have one by uh, July 4th, um, you know, had changed the psychology of uh, the, the office user. Um, you've started to see from that moment on companies that were hesitant to actually uh, you know, announce when they were gonna bring their workforces back to the offices, uh, start uh, making those announcements, getting much more aggressive on those plans. Um, and so, and we've seen an upshot in leasing activity from what was really uh, you know, dormant, unprecedented low levels of, of activity in the market, of tenants being in the market to, to numbers that are now over 100% as to where they were uh, last year in terms of tenants in the markets, whether that's technology, financial service firms, uh, longer term leases, flight to quality, things that you would expect, but there's, there's real activity right there right now. And so that, that's encouraging for New York. Um, and I think that this is not gonna be, you know, it's not gonna be a, a light switch that turns on or, and turns on and everything changes overnight. But I think we're now on a clear path of a uh, beginning our, our recovery in the office market. What do you think about this return to work? Will people be working five days a week or is it gonna change to let's say three to four days in the office? I make it a point every day to speak to a series of um, executives about how they're thinking about coming back to work. And, and the one thing that is clear is no one has a definitive 
answer. Everyone has a theory and everyone's going to test that theory. And the second thing for clear is that's clear is it's not going to be the way it was before, right? The, the workplace of the, of the future post COVID is going to be very different than it was uh, pre COVID. And, you know, I think that uh, people are going to be thinking about the workplace, more of a place where you come to, uh, to, to, to come together, to have a sense of community, to build a sense of, of, of culture and values, uh, collaboration, mentorship, and, and that's gonna be what drives the workplace. So it's gonna be much more highly curated on generating those activities. We've also learned that you can work remotely. And I think that as companies think about bringing back their employees, they're trying to figure out what's the right balance between having people work remotely for some of the time and in the office um, the, for a portion of the time. And the, the, the general consensus that I'm hearing right now is that um, people view there's going to be some percentage, let's call it 10 to 15% of the people that need to be in the office full time with maybe that's compliance or things like that. There's 10 to 15% of the people that can actually work remotely almost full time. And that's, you know, let's call that, you know, call centers or something of that nature. Uh, and then everyone else is going to be on some hybrid work model. And that hybrid work model uh, could mean they could be in the office three or four days a week and work remotely closer to home that other day or two a week. And that when they're in the office and when they're at home, they're going to have um, you know, much more curated activities that are more complementary to the environment that they're in. So when in their office, it's about engagement. When they're at home, it's about focus. And they're not going to come to the office and do video teleconferences um, all day because that's that's a not a, a waste of time to bring them to the office it's going to be about an experience and um you know but as i said this is a hypothesis it's it's, it's evolving quickly um if you go back you know to uh, the, you know i would say the end of the year there were points where uh polls that were out there said that 70 percent of the companies polled so they'd get rid of some of their workforce now it's work workspace now it's down to 15 percent, right so i think as people get smarter and people start coming back to the workplace, they realize how important it is to be in the workplace. And, uh, and I think it will actually become self-reinforcing uh, as people come back in the, the months ahead and, and, and really by Labor Day is where we'd expect the larger amount of, uh, of office workers to come back. What's your thoughts about the co-working and hoteling, which has always been a subject of, of confrontation over the last couple of years? So I think I think uh, companies are still going to place a premium on flexibility, uh, particularly as they're trying to figure this out. So I think flexible work providers that have fully curated spaces um, that have the the activation and create a sense of hospitality and community that I was describing before, um, you know, probably um, do well in this environment. I think uh, traditional co-working, I don't really think does well in its current form, but there might be some form, frankly, in the suburbs where people who are working remotely but don't want to work in an apartment want to go to a place where they can actually have a, a workstation or a Zoom room, um, and, and that may be the future uh, of that. Uh, and a hoteling, I think, um, is, is, is something that people are, is, is overplayed. Personally, I think that if, you, if the goal right now is to make the office place, the workplace, as magnetic as possible, you want to make it as attractive as possible for people to come back to the workplace, um, I don't think people want to have to go online to figure out where they're going to sit. They're going to want to know where they're going to sit when they get there. They're going to want to know there's a place for them to be. They're going to want to know where their colleagues are so they can easily find them to, to interact. So I think hoteling, while conceptually I know people are talking about it, I think that's something that doesn't uh, get a lot of, uh, of uh, use uh, in a post-COVID world. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example just sort of where we are just to help set the mind frame, right? Because this is not the first time e-commerce has disrupted uh, a real estate segment. If you think about what happened with retail and when e-commerce began to take hold, people that could actually uh, would shop online and they would only go to the mall or the shopping center uh, if they were gonna go for an experience. It was an outing for them. Otherwise it's easier just to go online and buy something and have it delivered. The same is true of the workplace. If you can work um, remotely or at home and it's convenient to do so, you're not gonna go to the, the office unless that is an experience, that's an engagement, that's something that not only within the office, but the, the energy around the office, the, around the community, the local restaurants, the local businesses, um, you know, it creates a, a, a dynamic that is appealing to people, that's magnetic to people, um, that makes them feel that they have a, a, they're part of something bigger, they have a sense of purpose. Um, and so I think that is how people are gonna have to think about the workplace 
And there'll be some buildings, just like there were some retail establishments that aren't gonna be able to adapt. So in, in, in this, you'll see a flight to quality and you'll see also an acceleration of buildings that aren't able to uh, adapt become obsolete more quickly and irrespective of price, um, I think they'll, they'll end up being non-competitive. And we're already seeing in terms of the activity that's out in the market right now, this flight to quality where 70, 75% of the activity is in the class A buildings that are well, well located by public transportation. And I would expect that to be something that continues as we work our way into this uh, recovery. With regard to that, what's your thoughts about the conversion, you know, which was originally the 421Gs in Lower Manhattan to help the buildings over there? Do you believe that some of these Class C buildings and other properties, including hotels, will be converted into residential? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Michael. And I, and I, I am a big believer that, um, you know, COVID has accelerated 10 years of activity into 10 months. And public policy and the way we did things before aren't going to be equipped to deal with the new environment that COVID has created. So we need to be bold and do things differently than we did before. And one of the bold things that we could do is, is make it easy to convert um, the non-competitive obsolete office buildings and hotels to alternative uses and try to accelerate that conversion over the next two, three, four years uh, so that we can, you know, create more housing and help our affordability challenges so we can bring back uh, energy and life to um, the, the the streets and the neighborhoods where those buildings are. Because if you have vacant buildings, there's no reason there to be local restaurants or local stores or people to walk down those streets, right? So we need to do that. If we have to go through the arcane approval processes and some of the nimbyism that goes along with that, it's gonna take way too long to help us make this transformation. So I think it's critical um, that we find, you know, po from a policy standpoint, I know the state put forward something that didn't pass. Hopefully the city will and the state will jump on board to be support supportive of it, but I think we should find ways to help accelerate that process. Now, one area which you've got involved with, and it was in the Wall Street Journal, I think it's a major topic of discussion, is SPACs in real estate. What's your thoughts? And I know, I believe you're involved with SPACs. You've created a SPAC. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts. Yeah, so you know, really, a SPAC, if you think about it, is um, a way for a company to go public that um, it has some situation that they're better situated to be able to tell investors their story and share a forecast of where their business is and going to be um, without some of the limitations of a, a true IPO. And so by you know forming a SPAC like we did, uh, we have now have a public company that will then uh, find a, what they call a target, a merger candidate that would then merge that business into um, our company and help value that business. And because we'll have the ability to look at that company's business plan, their forecast, understanding what their potential is, um, we should be able to value that more effectively than they would get in the public company, in the public markets rather, um, through a traditional IPO. And we should be able to add value by helping um, provide insights about what our customers and the type of customers that we have that they might want to sell to need, maybe access to our customers and our experience running uh, multiple public companies like we have in the, in the past. So I think the SPAC as an alternative to a traditional IPO makes a lot of sense. Um, and that makes a lot of sense for companies that are in their uh, emergence of growth, but yet haven't had that growth um, show up in their historical numbers. And in a world where COVID has accelerated so much, uh, you know, looking historically isn't necessarily going to be um, a, a good barometer of what's going to happen in the future. Or if there's companies that maybe have merged or pulled out of another company where you didn't have standalone financials, where you can then look through and, and develop a pro forma. So I think there's, there's an opportunity for that um, as we go forward in New York. There's a lot of, of, of companies that I think are well positioned to benefit from the SPAC market. Let's talk about the prop tech world, which you're also involved with. Yeah, so uh, again, COVID being an accelerant, um, and I think probably there's no area um, that's been more accelerated than technology. And you know, for the last number of years, we and a number of our peers have been very focused on the digitization of our industry. We have a digital lab with 25 uh, product development people, engineers, data scientists that we stood up uh, a couple of years ago uh, now and are developing our own products. We have a, 
a digital ventures uh, uh, fund that we invest in, in, in other businesses that, that, that are interesting in, in that area. And, and so we, we think this is gonna be uh, an, an important paradigm right now where the digitization of our industry is gonna finally become a reality. It went from creating products or offering products with data and, 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 and digital tools as a nice thing to have, as now a need to have. And a good example is COVID, right? When COVID hit, we had to bring our uh, employees and our uh, tenants back to our buildings safely. And we used our, our uh, digital lab to develop what we call RxWell, which provided transparency for people coming back to the buildings in terms of, um, of them complying with face mask wearing, temperature reading, the health and wellness of the building, social distancing, where there was congestion in the buildings, everything on the on an app that they can can provide information and get information to ensure that they were safe, felt safe, changed their behavior, and got the most of the workplace in that new abnormal we had to live with. And now we're taking that same strategy and focusing on the, what you just mentioned before, the hybrid workplace where people are working in the office part-time and at home it's going to require us now to use uh, technology to have transparency and data as to actually what's really happening in the office. How often am I in the office? When I'm in the office, who am I connecting with? Who do I want to connect with? Am I using this time productively? Am I using the amenities effectively? Is the programming that's being, being put in place creating the outcome and the positive sentiment that, that you'd want from your team members? And I think part of this paradigm shift of of making the office place and the workplace more of magnetic is that, that companies need to think about their team members like they think about their consumers. They need to understand um, what's impacting them so that when they go and, 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 and attract the, the best and brightest around that they can retain them the longest and get them to a point where they feel productive, or where they are productive, where they feel like they're getting a, a fulfilling career, but that takes a feedback loop and information insights that historically we as an industry didn't have. And now because of, of some of the new tools uh, in, in prop tech and IOT and AI and computer vision, uh, we're gonna have those tools at our fingertips. You're rather active, you're the developer in uh, New Rochelle. Let's talk about what's happening in Westchester County. And also you're in Stanford. The other element of COVID and it was a trend that we began to see beforehand was there was gonna be more of a regional um, uh, view of our of, of our markets, whereas if you go back in history, right, there went the periods in the 70s, there was urban flight, and over the last couple of decades, there was people leaving the suburbs and coming to the city, and so you had a period where one did well, one did poorly, and vice versa. I think that this recovery is going to be much more interconnected, and that you're going to need to rely on not only what's happening in the city, but the markets that surround the city are gonna play a pivotal part in helping uh, provide places for people to live, uh, the, the downtowns that provide that quality of life, that urban but suburban type settings that people can afford and, um, and have the walkability, diversity, um, restaurants and, and, and nightlife that they would want. And we're seeing that, and that's what you know, we're seeing as we build out New Rochelle and the demand that we're seeing there, transit-oriented developments where people can live there for 30 to 50% less than owning or leasing in Manhattan and they're still 30 minutes away from Midtown Manhattan. Same thing in Stanford, that's just, it's 45 minutes. Or in Long Island, where we have a ferry, uh, is 40 minutes to, uh, to Manhattan. So I think that interconnectivity, again, is gonna be something that's gonna be um, equally important as we go through um, this, this other side of COVID. You know, one of the leading indicators for New York has always been talent, right? Talent is what drives companies to wanna be here. And we have already seen uh, since literally the end of last year, but just keeps picking up steam as we've gone into this year, more and more um, people coming back to the city in the rental market. We've seen rental activity up 90% from where it was in 2019, forget 2020. And it's people that are coming back to New York or come to New York for the first time and say, you know, I think I could, where, where rents are today, I can afford it to try and take advantage of the opportunity to come back to New York. So it's quickly creating a recovery in the multifamily market. Um, and, and it's also a great indicator of people's belief in the long-term vitality of New York. And if that talent's here, that's gonna bring the companies here. And the same thing, by the way, on luxury housing, where we've seen now for the first time since 2006, 
um, I think it's 11 weeks where we've had over 30 um, contracts signed of $4 million or more. Now, again, prices are down 20% or more, but people are making the commitment to New York. They're writing big checks. They plan on being here. And that gives me a lot of confidence uh, in terms of uh, our, our, our future recovery. With regard to e-commerce, you just recently signed a large deal with Amazon in Maspeth. Let's talk about e-commerce. And also, there was a major change, and you were part of it a number of years ago, converting industrial properties to office. So I'd like you to address both of those subjects. As, again, another accelerant has been um, people ordering online and e-commerce, and this has been something that Amazon and their peers have been focused on for some time, which is how do you get closer to that consumer that they would call it the sort of last mile distribution facility. And so in Maspeth, Queens, we're building a, a 1.3 million square foot distribution facility. Uh, that's an eco-friendly uh, distribution facility that all of the vans will be electric vehicles uh, that Amazon's uh, bringing there and will be able to actually distribute more locally. And we're seeing, so, we, and that's a, a big part of where we see growth is how do you now uh, bring e-commerce into urban environments where they can actually serve customers um, in same day or next day delivery efficiently and effectively. And I think not only you're seeing that, I think you're also seeing um, micro um, distribution where within the city itself, you'll see uh, micro distribution centers where people, uh, where, where companies will make deliveries in bulk during the night. So you don't have the congestion on our streets. Uh, and then during the day, either by, you know, uh, a bike or by uh, people uh, walking the goods will then make deliveries locally. And I think that's another evolution that we're going to see uh, as we as we go forward. The industrial market, the conversions from office, from industrial to office, do you see that changing or what do you, what's your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think you're going to see less of it um, in, because I think part of the, um, and, and it depends on the character of the building, but there is such a strong demand and such a, um, lack of supply of good locations for uh, distribution facilities that you can, the economics for the right uh, uh, distribution facility is probably better than converting it to an office building today. Where do you see the opportunities for your company? You've been buying uh, some real estate loans. You've been buying some assets some unsold condos. Where do you see the opportunities for RxR Realty? Yeah, so, you know, in, when we, uh, uh, formed ourselves in 07. In 09, August of 09, we came back into the market. And at the time, we saw a big dislocation in the office market. We saw that the the prices of office buildings were much lower and you were able to buy irreplaceable buildings um, at big discounts to replacement cost. And we bought about $4 billion of buildings over that next 12 to 18 months. Uh, we, we're seeing something similar right now, but on the multifamily side. Um, and so we've, we've uh, acquired already over a billion dollars of uh, or, co or sign contracts over a billion dollars in multifamily. We have another billion dollars that we're working on right now. Um, and I think that, you know, we're gonna look back like we did in, in 09, 10 on those multifamily properties that we're buying and saying, wow, that, that these were, were great buys um, and we bought them at great values because of this location in the market. The other area that we're focused on is what we call mega trends, which are e-commerce uh, related type things like logistics centers, um, or, or similarly like film studios where you have streaming videos, which we're working on a project in Red Hook uh, for that, or healthcare uh, oriented where we've noted, noted through this experience, all of us that we've woefully underinvested in healthcare. And so we're working on telecare or other public private partnerships with healthcare institutions as they think about expanding and shifting their businesses um, as they get uh, past this process. And then in that obsolescence that you referred to before, one of the things that we have been very successful at in the past is uh, is converting obsolete buildings to uses that are more uh, appropriately set for the current environment. So you know, we're working on three different malls, for example, where we could convert parts of those malls to multifamily, self-storage, uh, data centers, um, and, and things of that nature. So where you could take something where there isn't demand today and convert it into a product where there is demand uh, in the future. Let's talk about the... Um... 175 Park Avenue, AKA the former, the current Grand Hyatt. Uh, what we have seen, and we're still seeing the market, and you look at great job SO Green did um, with one Vanderbilt and the great success that's happened on Hudson Yards with Related and, and Oxford. Uh, you know, we believe there's a flight to quality and there's a premium that 
large companies that want to be in New York are going to be willing to pay for new product that have the health and wellness infrastructure, outdoor space, amenities that are, 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 are digitally advanced, as we discussed uh, uh, before, are, are leading in sustainability uh, and create a, that presence and sense of energy that, want, uh, that make for a place that people want to come work at. And so what our plans are for uh, the old Hyatt Hotel is to build just that, is to build uh, you know, what we believe will be one of, if not the most prominent uh, office buildings, you know, fully amenitized, incredible architecture, incredible views, sitting literally on top of Grand Central Station, unparalleled access to public transportation, um, and a lot of outdoor space uh, along the way. So we're, we're in the process of um, getting all of our approvals in place. We hope to have them done by the end of this year. And, um, and we're talking to uh, multiple anchor tenants um, that would enable us to kick off that project. So, you know, a half an hour is never not enough time to have Mike Stiller and Scott Reckwa, but I think you've given me your thoughts and insight. I'm happy to celebrate my 1300th show with you today, and I hope to see you in many months and for the future. Michael, thanks for having me, and, and I'm honored to be your 1300th guest. And again, congratulations on that and the 20 years. 1300th show. 1300th show, right? It's probably multiples of that, I guess. So, congratulations.